Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome. Today I've got an episode for you that I've had on my list for a really, really long time. I want to delve into the world of false confessions, look at some cases in which people have confessed to crimes they didn't commit, and why it is they do such a thing. Is it psychological pressure? Is it a want to be remembered for something? Is it just trying to escape another life? I have a feeling this is going to be a really interesting episode delving right into the psychology behind this, so please get yourselves comfortable. The definition of a false confession is quite simple, it's an admission of guilt for a crime that the individual did not commit. Now this is different from a forced confession where the use of torture or a threat, blackmail, is used to induce the confession whether it's true or not. I want to begin here with some data and some statistics surrounding false confessions because you all know I love data. According to the Innocence Project, researchers who study this phenomenon have found that the five things that often contribute to or cause false confessions are 1. The real or perceived intimidation of the suspect by law enforcement 2. The use of force by law enforcement during the interrogation or at least a perceived threat of force 3. A compromised reasoning ability of the subject, so if they're exhausted, stressed, hungry, or even just have a low IQ or mental limitations, they are considered compromised. It's in these cases that young people are particularly vulnerable, they've got a lack of life experience and a lack of understanding of their own rights, and a lot of people are taught to please authority figures from a young age. And I'm not just talking young adults here, I'm talking juveniles under the age of 18 are really, really susceptible to this. Number four is devious interrogation techniques, such as untrue statements about the presence of incriminating evidence. And number five is a fear that a failure to confess will yield a harsher punishment. I mean, you see this all the time in true crime documentaries, don't you? If somebody confesses now, then the police will be able to help them out. They'll get them a lighter sentence or get them off the death penalty. Data I found from here in the UK states there have been 93 total cases of false confession related miscarriages of justice since the early 1970s. And that's just the cases that have been overturned since. The likelihood is there are way more out there. So that's 943.8 years lost in total, years spent in prison for the people who have given false confessions, with the confessors spending on average 10.15 years in prison each. That is a pretty long time. In terms of finding numbers for the USA, I came across the National Registry of Exonerations. They state there have been 3,237 exonerations since 1989, and that's more than 27,200 years lost, with each person spending 6.9 years in prison on average. They actually have a really fantastic map where you can see the really detailed data surrounding this. You can see exonerations by year, by state, you can filter by crime and gender and race. I'll actually link it down below because there's no way I can share all of the data in this video, but I do want to share some of the key points. 37% of exonerations were in cases of murder, 53% were for black people and 91% were men. The most exonerations have happened in the states of Texas and Illinois, with New York and California following closely behind. What I found most interesting though is exonerations by year. As you can see if you're watching this on YouTube, since 2014 the number of exonerations have shot up hugely, and I can only assume that this is thanks to DNA technology, old forensic evidence being reanalyzed and people being exonerated on the back of that but it doesn't explicitly say that, that's just sort of how I'm reading it. Also, according to the National Registry, 27% of the people in their registry who had been accused of homicide had given false confessions, and 81% of people with mental illness or intellectual disabilities had done the same. 81%, that is huge. Confessions have always been considered as the gold standard of good police work. If you can get somebody to confess to a crime, then that's your job done. The assumption has always been that people won't confess to a crime they didn't commit, but we now know that that's not quite the case. Although saying that, there have been red flags around the legitimacy of confessions from as early as 1908, when a Harvard psychologist called Hugo Munsterberg warned about untrue confessions under the spell of overpowering influences, but of course not many people paid attention back in 1908. 
It wasn't until around the 1980s-ish that researchers started to see the full extent of false confessions around the world, thanks to many prevalent cases of false confessions in that decade. I mean, I'm sure we've all heard of the Central Park Five, in which five black and Hispanic teenage boys were convicted of the rape of a woman in Central Park. Four of them made confessions, even though DNA evidence from the scene didn't match any of them. Many years later they would be exonerated of this crime, but it ruined their lives. You've also got convicted serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, who I do intend to do a whole video on eventually, but he was convicted of the murders of his mother and two others, Kate Rich and Becky Powell, in 1983. Over the next few decades, Lucas would confess to hundreds of other murders, earning him the nickname of the Confession Killer. But it is often considered that he was much more of a pathological liar than he was a prolific serial killer. When Lucas started confessing, the Texas Rangers formed the Lucas Task Force to look into each and every case. Lucas confessed to hundreds of cases, but he was just lying. Why? Well, it seems that in order to keep the confessions flowing, which brought a lot of attention and acclaim to the Texas Rangers and Sheriff Jim Bootwell, the task force would give Lucas five star treatment. He actually lived quite a cushy life in prison. He was supplied with all the cigarettes and food he wanted. He was allowed to wander freely without handcuffs and he even knew the security codes for the doors. He would be taken out, taken to restaurants and cafes for his trouble. Why wouldn't he confess to anything and everything when his confessions are allowing him to live this life? He's in prison, but he's living the best prison life possible. But it does go even deeper than that. Lucas would often go for the low-lying fruit, easily obtained vague confessions in cases that had minimal evidence to prove otherwise. It's also claimed that the Rangers would even feed Lucas information in several cases because he became just a great way to close off a load of those pesky unsolved cases that made the department look bad. The priority for the Texas Rangers wasn't actually about getting justice for people who'd be murdered, it was about washing their hands of them. Often, the Rangers would even provide Lucas with crime scene photos and details about the victims at the crime scene and then he would make the official confession. Some allegations even claim that the Rangers would let him read the case files, meaning he would have access to all of the little details, and then it would be virtually impossible to tell if he was lying or not. This all fell apart though when a journalist called Hugh Ainsworth with the Dallas Times Herald took a closer look and very, very quickly realised there was no way Lucas could have committed all the murders he was claiming to. I mean, sometimes he wasn't even in the state at the time they were committed, something that was very easily proven. All of this came out in 1985, but regardless, Luke was be convicted of 11 homicides in total. He was even sentenced to death in the case of a then unidentified Jane Doe who was called Orange Socks. We now know that she was Deborah Jackson. But then it came out that he'd been given access to the case file, so his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment instead. Lucas ended up dying of heart failure in 2001, but not before he recanted a load of his confessions. To this day, nobody really knows how many murders he was responsible for. Some do think he committed well over 100, others think that it was just the three that he was originally arrested for. DNA evidence to this point has proved that he did not kill 20 of his supposed victims that he confessed to. All of that to say, by the mid 80s people were becoming very aware of false confessions and the psychology behind them wasn't always simple. Psychologist Saul Cassin from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City is one of the world's leading experts on interrogation and he has studied false confessions extensively over many, many years. In his studies, he learned of something called the Reed Interrogation Technique, a near universal method of interrogation taught to police in the USA and around the world. It's said to be incredibly effective at getting confessions out of people, but even when the person in question is innocent. The technique starts with a behavioural assessment of the suspect, where the officer asks a number of basic questions whilst looking for signs of deception. If the suspect appears to be lying, with no regard for the very uncomfortable and scary situation the person has found themselves in, then they move on to phase two, which is the formal interrogation. Here, the suspect is repeatedly accused of the crime and ignored when they deny their involvement and it's insisted that the suspect tells them every single detail. 
The investigator offers sympathy and minimises the moral aspect of the crime in question, making the suspect feel comfortable and open to confession. A lot of the time this involves some victim blaming, like this wouldn't happen if this hadn't happened. It's psychological pressure at its finest. And Cassin actually tested this interrogation technique out with a number of student volunteers in the early 90s. Cassin called his experiment the computer crash paradigm, in which he had students take dictation on computers. He warned the students that the system had a glitch, and if they pressed the ALT key at any point, the whole system would crash, so essentially don't press the ALT key. That part wasn't true, the computers had been pre-programmed to crash regardless, and when they did so, the students would be accused of hitting the ALT key. None of the students confessed to doing it at first, but then Cassin added some techniques he'd learned about actual police interrogation tactics, like falsely saying they had a witness who had seen them do it. After that point, students started confessing. Nearly every student facing this made-up witness accusation ended up confessing. Very interestingly, when they were later told what the experiment had been, some of the students had internalised the guilt of doing so, so, so deeply, that they refused to accept the truth. And this is in a very low-stakes scenario. Imagine the pressure of being accused of a murder or a huge crime like that. Under US law, police are permitted to lie to suspects, which just blows my mind. Whilst here in the UK, police are not allowed to lie to suspects under any circumstances, which I must admit I was very relieved to find out in my research. And I suppose with all that information, we should take a look at some actual cases of false confessions. And there were so many stories I could have picked to tell in this video and I had to kind of narrow it down. So if you do find this interesting and want a part two, then please do let me know in the comments. We're going to start with the story of Laverne Pavlinak, an American woman who falsely confessed to assisting in a murder, alongside implicating her boyfriend, 39-year-old John Sosnovsky. It was the 22nd of January 1990 when the body of 23-year-old Tonya Bennett was found in a remote area of the Columbia Gorge, just outside of Portland, Oregon. I do think her name is pronounced Tonya, but some news reports I watched said Tonya, so if I am pronouncing it wrong, I'm really sorry. I'm going to go with Tonya, but I'm not sure. Tonya had disappeared the day before, and it was a tragic death. She had been beaten, raped and strangled, and the police really struggled with the investigation into her murder in the early days. They had a complete lack of leads. So they started to share the details of the murder with the public, in the hope that somebody would come forward with any information. And then someone did. On the 5th of February 1990, the Multnomah PD received an anonymous phone call from a woman, claiming that she had overheard a man bragging in a bar about being the one responsible for Tonya's murder. The man's name was John Sosnovsky, but the name would be misspelt in the police report, meaning it was never followed up on. That was until the following week when a second anonymous phone call was made. It was very quickly determined that the caller was John's 57-year-old girlfriend, Laverne Pavlinak. Now both of them, Laverne and John, were interviewed, and Laverne was even sent home with a wire on to try and catch John confessing, but he didn't at any point. And so, in following interviews, Laverne implicated herself as well, saying that she knew that John was the one responsible for the murder because she herself had been present when it happened. He had forced her to help him rape Tonya and dispose of the body. Police then interviewed John again, who denied all the claims, and a subsequent search failed to turn up any actual evidence. So then Laverne told police that she'd found items in the trunk of her car that matched those sought in a search warrant. Even at this time, the police suspected that these items had been planted, but they continued to interview Laverne. They even took her to the area that Tonya's body had been found to see if she could identify the correct spot where the body had been and she was able to do so. However, she wasn't able to correctly identify where they found some personal items. Despite this, and the fact that eyewitnesses from the bar where Tonya was the night before she disappeared, stated they never saw her with John that night, both John and Laverne were arrested in February 1990. By the time the trial came around, Laverne had had a change of heart and recanted her confession. She had made up, she said, saying that she was in a terribly abusive relationship with John and she saw no other way of escape. She wanted him to go to prison so she could finally be free. 
but the confession was already recorded and she'd successfully identified the spot the body had been found. Her trial came first and in January 1991 she was convicted of felony murder, sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 10 years. Then John's trial came next and he pleaded no contest to the murder and kidnapping charges against him, fearing that he would get the death penalty if he pleaded not guilty. In March 1991 he was also sentenced to life in prison. And they would have remained in prison for the entirety of their sentences had Keith Hunter Jesperson, also known as the Happy Face Killer, not been arrested in March 1995 for another murder. He then confessed to eight other murders, including that of Tonya Bennett, saying he picked her up at a bar in Portland and had taken her back to his home before killing her. His confession was thought to be true from very early on, with the district attorney confirming that all the claims he made were completely corroborated by law enforcement. He also said that he wanted to come clean and get it all over with, set the record straight. Apparently murder didn't bother him too much, but the thought of two innocent people in prison for his crime was, that's one of the main reasons he confessed. Jesperson was convicted of Tonya's murder, amongst others, but still, John and Laverne were not released from prison. The judge actually refused to exonerate them at first because apparently just because Jesperson was guilty, it didn't mean that John and Laverne were innocent. They could have been involved in some way. It got to the point that Jesperson himself started writing letters to the news and media outlets, urging them to spread the word and get Laverne and John freed. Finally, on November 27th, 1995, the judge freed them both, saying there's no longer any doubt that these two individuals are innocent, the evidence is compelling. However, Laverne was told off for abusing the judicial system, with the judge saying, Pavlinak has selfishly engaged in an obsessive and persistent obstruction of justice, which deflected the investigation at an early stage, causing it to focus on her boyfriend, Sosnovsky while the real killer remained free to kill again and again. Her persistence in this manipulation resulted in her own conviction. The judge actually didn't see fit to overturn Laverne's conviction, saying that he couldn't find a constitutional defect with her trial. But John was completely exonerated, citing a violation of his civil rights. Laverne didn't face any extra charges for her lies as she'd already served enough time. Laverne said at her trial that she just started to lie and it all snowballed out of her control. She would later say that she was a desperate woman in an abusive relationship and desperate times called for desperate measures, a sentiment that has been agreed upon by her own daughters in interviews. Laverne was apparently at a very bad place in her life when she met John a decade beforehand. She divorced her first husband after he left her for another woman and she remarried but her second husband died just a few years later. Around this same time, Laverne's son also died. Her daughter says that so many bad things happened in such a short period of time that something just made Laverne snap. Laverne was apparently always a very giving, kind woman who would give you the shirt off her own back if you needed it. But even those closest to her struggled to fully understand why she did what she did. A false confession implicating yourself in a crime is one thing, but implicating somebody else is a whole other situation. I really can only assume that she found herself backed into a corner with an abusive relationship, but we'll never know for sure what she was thinking as she died in 2003. The second story I have for you is that of a man called Stor Bergwell. Now this is probably a story I could do a whole video on in itself, so again let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that, but he was also known by the name of Thomas Quick, or the fake serial killer. He's a Swedish man who was previously believed to have been a prolific serial killer, having confessed to more than 30 murders and convicted of eight. Stuart was the man, Thomas Quick was the murderous alter ego. And this man did very much have a history of criminal behaviour, including child abuse, assaults and drug use, so he wasn't exactly an innocent, law-abiding person. In 1991, he was sentenced for armed robbery, in which he was soon confined to an institution for the criminally insane. It was once he was here that the confessions would start. In the years since this, Bergwall has spoken publicly about the claims that he made, showing an understanding of why he did what he did. I mean, I suppose that's one of the perks of having 24-7 access to a psychiatrist, self-reflection. But that's also kind of what led to the lies. 
He says that he just craved a sense of belonging in an incredibly lonely institution with no one to connect with. He told The Guardian back in 2012, I was in a place with violent criminals and I noticed that the worse or more violent or serious the crimes, the more interest someone got from the psychiatric personnel. I also wanted to belong to that group, to be an interesting person in here. Bergwall was an incredibly intelligent person who had spent time in his younger years reading up on psychoanalysis. He knew what to say to capture the attention of his doctors. One day, he says, he asked his therapist, what would you say if I had done something really bad? He felt his doctor's interest rise, and so he continued. Maybe I murdered someone. And from there, very much like in Laverne's case, things snowballed. Bergwall slash Thomas Quick, I'm just going to call him Bergwall, first confessed to a murder that everyone in Sweden was aware of, everyone knew the details of, and that was of Johan Asplund, an 11-year-old who had disappeared in November 1980. His body was never found. Bergwall said that he picked Johan up outside his school and took him away, raping and killing him before dismembering his body so no one would ever find him. He went deep and dark with his confessions, and the darker it was, the more people paid attention. Of course, investigators went out to search the area in which Bergwall claimed that he buried Johan, but nothing was ever found. It would take nine years in total for law enforcement to make any kind of case against him, but in 2001, he would actually be convicted for this crime, for Johan's murder. By that point, he had confessed to and be found guilty of seven other murders as well. Bergwall was confessed to anything and seemingly had no MO. Children, adults, men and women, anyone was fair game. He would allegedly kill across different areas of Norway and Sweden. In 1996, he confessed to the murder of a nine-year-old girl from Norway eight years beforehand, and that was Therese Johansson. Despite getting almost every detail of her murder wrong, including her appearance, he was interviewed extensively multiple times about this case, and he would be convicted of her murder on the basis of some bone fragments that were found. Later testing though showed that what they found wasn't even bone. Although a lot of people on the outside of all this, a lot of people in the public did question the confessions at the time, it was ironically the involvement of professional psychiatrists here that complicated everything. Psychiatrists put down the lack of detail in confessions to repressed memories or trauma, meaning that he was unable to put things into sharper detail until he received further therapy. Any questions at trial about his confessions were generally put down to this. The therapist always had an answer. Even when it was found that Bergwall had rock-solid alibis for some of the crimes, he would still be convicted. It was easier to say it was him and close a case than continue the search, very similar to the Henry Lee Lucas case. In one case, he confessed to the killing of a woman in Norway in 1985, claiming that he had sex with her, even though it was very, very well known that he was gay. There had been traces of sperm found at the scene that DNA analysis ruled out as belonging to Bergwall, but still the courts found him guilty beyond all reasonable doubts. It's almost beyond belief, but I suppose when you've got a guy who's already been convicted of so many crimes, it's not unbelievable that he'd be responsible for more. And meanwhile, Bergwall, under the name of Thomas Quick, was becoming one of the most famous men in Scandinavia, finally getting the attention that he craved. It wasn't until 2008 that Bergwall admitted to his lies, he'd made all of his confessions up. Some people refused to believe this, saying that he knew details of too many cases that only the killer would know. However, he would confess that in his early days in hospital, he was still allowed regular leaves of absence, and on those days, he would go to the Royal Libraries in Stockholm and read up on old cases, study old newspaper articles. He'd note details like the positioning of bodies, the victim's clothing, small details he knew would make the authorities pay attention. He also said that he was on heavy drugs during his therapy sessions, a cocktail of benzos, and a very common side effect of benzos are reduced inhibitions, a lack of impulse control. The words would have flowed with very little care for what he was actually saying. 
Burgle said himself that he'd have a lot of fantasies whilst he was on these drugs and his imagination would run wild, giving him a lot of creativity within his stories. And it kind of became this vicious circle for him. The more stories he told, the more attention he'd get, more therapy sessions, more drugs and so on. He got somewhat of a team around him, a family, the same people following through on investigations for each confession, the same familiar faces and a lot of the time they take him with them to the crime scenes. There should have been checks and balances in place to ensure that everything here was above board, that he was telling the truth, but that never seemed to happen. And not only was Burgwall affected here, but the families of all the victims were forced to suffer through their traumas once again, relive all of this for a confession that wasn't even true. I mean, in the case of Johan, his family were floored by Burgwall's confession, because they'd always thought they knew who the perpetrator was, it was somebody connected to their family, and they'd gone through a whole private prosecution in this case. When Burgwall confessed, it put an end to their fight against who they're still sure is the real perpetrator for good. The Asplunds are also convinced that the police were feeding Burgwall information as well, saying that everything they would tell investigators would just so happen to come out in Burgwall's therapy sessions just weeks later, such as information about a birthmark Johan had. Is still Bergwall slash Thomas Quick an innocent person? Absolutely not. He's a criminal in so many ways and he knew what he was doing in his confessions. He wasn't exactly coerced into making them. But he should have been stopped. He was totally enabled by the authorities in this case. And he was a hospital patient. He was vulnerable. He was mentally ill and they should have spotted that. In July 2013, he was acquitted of the last eight murder convictions and he was eventually released from hospital on a treatment plan, although it does appear he's no longer on that. I don't know what he's doing now, he seems to be just living life under the radar. Next up, I want to share an incredibly sad story for you that actually links back to the satanic panic. If you haven't watched or listened to my episode on that already, then I would highly recommend you do so. It's absolutely fascinating, even if I do say so myself, and one of my favourite episodes I've ever made. This story takes us back to 1988, when 22-year-old Erica Ingram and 18-year-old Julie Ingram accused their father, Paul Ingram, of sexual abuse. Just a quick trigger warning here for childhood SA. Obviously, I don't go into detail about any of the accusations made, but if you don't want to hear any of that, then please just skip to the next part. This was a family, the Ingrams, that was incredibly well respected in their local community in East Olympia, Washington. Paul had been a deputy at the Thurston County Sheriff's Office for the last 16 years, and as you can imagine, these claims came as a shock to everyone in the community. Not least of all to Paul, who was obviously quickly arrested. Soon after this, the girls also cast suspicion on their mother Sandy, saying that she was also party to the abuse. They said she knew the abuse was going on and they never did anything to stop it. Erica mentioned her mother's involvement to a friend who then reported the conversation to the police. Sandy wasn't arrested, but the police did advise her to get a lawyer. As time went on, they would accuse more and more people of the sexual abuse, saying it would happen at their father's poker games, pointing the finger at his friends in the police department as well. They said that it went really, really deep in the community. When the oldest Ingram child was interviewed, Paul Jr., he remembered these poker parties from their childhood, and he did claim seeing something once that you certainly do not want to see between your parents and their friends, intense sexual scenes. But that was accidentally, he said. He hadn't meant to see that, and he got told off when they saw that he had seen. He also recalled his father being physically abusive, once throwing an axe at him, but he could never remember any sexual abuse on him or his siblings. When he insisted that he couldn't remember anything, the interviewer reportedly backed him up against a wall and told him, we know you're a victim. At that, Paul Jr. walked out and didn't return. Meanwhile, his sisters are escalating their stories. It got to a point where Paul Sr. was accused of participating in hundreds of satanic rituals, including the slaughter of 25 babies. And this is something you saw again and again with the satanic panic. The allegations never knew when to stop. If you are capable of sexual abuse of any kind, you are also capable of the ritualistic killing of babies. People, the religious, were terrified of Satan and they 100% believed during this panic that Satan had an influence on daily life. 
Therefore, nothing was ever too much, nothing was ever too far. Satan was capable of anything after all, and therefore he could influence anyone to do anything. The Ingrams were members of a local Pentecostal church, the Church of Living Water, and that church very much promoted the idea that Satan could control the minds of Christians, cause them to commit crimes, and then remove their memories of said crimes. This was something that was preached at the congregation on a weekly basis. It was fully believable to them. It would later turn out that it was whilst at a church retreat that one of the daughters was told by a woman who claimed to have prophetic power that she had been sexually abused by her father. This prophetic woman planted the seed that would snowball out of control and soon the daughters were accusing everyone of sexual abuse. Paul was arrested for his crimes in November 1988 and he immediately waived his rights to an attorney. The interviewing officers would later say that he confessed to the sexual abuse incredibly quickly. He was taken into custody, held without bail and was kept in solitary confinement for his own protection. He was a law enforcement officer after all and he was in big trouble in prison. Over the next several months, he would be interrogated on numerous occasions by an interrogation team that included law enforcement officers and a psychologist hired by the prosecution. Paul also met several times with his Pentecostal minister, who, as I mentioned just a moment ago, preached that Satan wiped people's memories of their crimes. In February 1989, so just a few months after he'd first been taken into custody, a sociologist called Robert Offshe was hired as a consultant by the prosecution and he joined the interrogation team. But on his very first day on the case, Offshe started to suspect that Paul wasn't confessing to crimes he had actually committed, but was instead self-inducing some kind of trance and was imagining the crimes as had been suggested to him. To test his theory, Offshe conducted an experiment. He introduced a supposedly false confession into the interrogation without any prior notice or approval from the detectives interviewing Paul. He fabricated a false scenario and asked Paul if he could remember this incident. Even when the daughter was later interviewed again, she denied such a scenario ever taking place. It was absolutely false. Initially, Paul said that he couldn't remember this incident, but Offshe encouraged him to use the same methods he'd used to remember the other alleged incidents before sending him back to his cell to ponder on it. The very next day, sure enough, Paul confessed, saying he had very clear memories of the incident and he produced a three-page written confession. Offshe then pressured him to renounce the confession, telling him it didn't really happen, which Paul didn't really want to do, saying that this incident was as real to him as everything else. He was convinced. Offshe concluded that the confessions were the result of false memories being implanted with suggestion, and Paul being a very highly religious individual was far more susceptible to this, considering the moral panic situation the USA was deeply embedded in at this time. Offshe believed Paul to be innocent of all of the allegations against him, but despite this, Paul pleaded guilty to six counts of third degree rape in May 1989. Two months later though, he reconsidered his confession and with a new attorney, filed a motion to withdraw his plea. This was a mess of a case. There had to be a whole hearing about the potential coercion and the judge did question Offshe's qualifications as a so-called social psychologist. The judge believed that Paul's own retained psychological expert indicated he was telling the truth, that he was a depraved individual, and therefore he refused to change the guilty plea. Paul ended up serving his whole sentence and was released in 2003. Now this case is a very complicated one. You will find certain people who do 100% believe that Paul Ingram was guilty of all the crimes he was accused of. But just as many people, including countless professionals, believe it was all fabricated, saying it was all pseudo-memories. One referred to this case as one of the most dramatic cases of forced memory of abuse to ever be documented. Because despite all of his confessions, no actual evidence of the abuse was ever found. Now I am absolutely not saying that victims in cases such as this are to be dismissed. 99% of the time you will be dealing with people who are telling the absolute truth. But everything about this specific case points towards it being the result of this weird microcosm of society. Saul Cassin, who I spoke about earlier in the video, wrote in 1996, 
After 23 interrogations, which extended for five months, Ingram was detained, hypnotised, provided with graphic crime details, told by a police psychologist that sex offenders typically repress their offences, and urged by the ministers of his church to confess. And voila, here we are with him being sentenced to 20 years in prison. And with that, let's move on to our final case study, the case of Earl Washington Jr. I've actually tried to go for four different cases in this video that kind of study different aspects of false confessions. And here we have 22-year-old Earl, who was accused of the rape and murder of 19-year-old Rebecca Williams in 1982. He was tried for capital murder, found guilty and was sentenced to death a sentence that more than a decade later was commuted to life in prison, and in a slightly happy ending, he was eventually exonerated in the year 2000 after a long fight by innocence teams. Rebecca Williams was a mother of three who was raped and stabbed over 30 times in her apartment in Culpeper, Virginia. She miraculously was able to provide a brief description of her attacker before she passed away, saying it was a black man who had acted alone. It wasn't until almost a year later that Earl Washington Jr. was arrested nearby for alleged burglary and malicious wounding. He was questioned by police for two days and they claimed that he had confessed to five different crimes in this time, including Rebecca's murder. Out of those five alleged confessions, the first four were dismissed because of inconsistencies with the testimony and the fact that victims of said crimes were unable to identify him as the perpetrator. However, there was no one to dispute Earl's involvement in Rebecca's case because she had died, and he had confessed to it after all. Earl Washington Jr. is a man with what we'd call today an intellectual disability. When he was examined by an expert, it was found that he had an IQ of just 69, which is equivalent to that of a 10-year-old and ranks him in the bottom 2% of the population. It was found that Earl was cooperative, gentle, and very importantly, always deferential to those in authority. Earl was always eager to please anyone in authority positions. It was likely to compensate for his low IQ. It's also important to note that alongside this, he was a black man and likely would have been taught to always be polite and affable to law enforcement. So when Earl was being questioned by them, he likely would have agreed with whatever they asked him in the hope to gain their approval. Upon initial questioning, Earl gave incorrect answers to a number of questions investigators asked about Rebecca's case. Things like Rebecca's race, height, weight, whether anyone else was in the apartment, how he entered. Earl said that he kicked the door in, but there was no sign of that. He also said that he only stabbed her two or three times when she was stabbed over 30 times. There was no forensic evidence to link Earl to the scene, despite him saying he cut himself whilst he was there. He would end up being interviewed about this multiple times and with each round his answers would get better, they'd fit better with the case. His lawyers would later say that it was clear that the interviewers were asking him leading questions and he was just agreeing with them when they made statements. The lawyers would later say rather generously that perhaps the interviewers didn't realise that Earl had a low IQ and they didn't figure out how easily led he was, but he clearly was led. A doctor would later write in regards to this case, all the circumstances surrounding the confession indicate that its contents came, intentionally or not, from the police and was simply parroted back by Earl. I mean he was only able to pick out the crime scene after being taken there three times in one afternoon by the police, who even then had to help him pick the correct one. And at the time all this was happening, Earl was given some not so good lawyers who failed to even discuss his intellectual disability at trial, and they didn't give any solid reason as to why Earl would give a false confession. The state psychologist testified claiming that Earl was competent when his statement was given, and so he was convicted and sentenced to death. In 1985, a fellow death row inmate actually took on Earl's case, as he was supposed to be being executed that very same year. The inmate was Joseph Giratano, who became a serious legal scholar whilst he was in prison, and he helped mount litigation to explore the constitutional rights of other prisoners. Earl was one of those, and it was Joseph who first noted Earl's intellectual disability. Joseph contacted people in the outside world who would be able to help pro bono and spread the word about his case. Just nine days before Earl's scheduled execution date, they managed to secure a stay. 
And the next few years were a battle. In October 1993, DNA testing finally revealed that semen found at the scene did not match Earl. However, because of laws in Virginia surrounding how long you have to enter evidence like this, he was not exonerated. And this is when his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. He remained in prison for another six years before additional testing could be done. And finally, in October 2000, the governor granted a pardon for the capital murder conviction. However, this did come with a condition that a jury would not have convicted him based on evidence as it was then known. He was released in February 2001, but it wasn't for another six years that an absolute pardon would be issued, finally acknowledging that he was wrongfully convicted. That very same year, somebody else was convicted for Rex murder, and Earl was awarded almost $2 million from the state for wrongful conviction. It has since been ruled on a federal level that the death penalty for people with intellectual disabilities is unconstitutional. Earl's case is the saddest of all to me. Something about the thought of him being in that interrogation room just answering yes to questions because he thought it was the right thing to do because he wanted to please authority, not understanding the repercussions of doing so, it just breaks my heart. I'm so grateful that DNA and forensic evidence came through for Earl in this case, but I can't help think about all the other innocent people who died on death row because of similar conditions. I'm not going to get into death penalty debate here, but this is one of the main reasons why I am personally anti-death penalty. Too many innocent people end up dying because of this. Too many innocent people die because of corrupt law enforcement, because they just want to get somebody convicted because of racism or prejudices or whatever. Earl had nothing to do with this and they most likely knew that. So there you go, an overview of false confessions and some fascinating case studies. I know this was a little bit different from my usual video format, but I found this so interesting to research, so I hope you found it equally interesting. I do have some other ideas of videos in this kind of genre, talking about maybe cases of police incompetence or parasomnia, last words, etc. So if you want to see any of those or have any other ideas, please do let me know. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.